I'm JJ Perez from Inside Runner Sports. That's Greg Luca from the San Antonio Express News. We're back. We're back. The Roadrunner recap, I think we're going to put I, that name on it. Your branding, it's your show. UT, UTSA falls to Houston in a thrilling, dramatic, triple overtime affair, 37-35. Greg, this was wild, wasn't it? Yeah, those are good adjectives, thrilling yeah. and dramatic. I think, you know, I think the big takeaway, and uh, the guys that we talked to after the game got to this sort of eventually, is that this proves that UTSA can... Obviously, play on an even yep. footing with the team that's ranked in the top 25 and could be in for a very strong year. You know, not a lot of people were necessarily picking UTSA. I think I saw on the game day ESPN deal. Nobody picked them. Nobody, and it was only a four-point um, line. So yeah. it's not like they were supposed to get crushed or whatever, but they they were as competitive as it gets, obviously, in this one. And I think there's probably a lot to be encouraged about and maybe some things that we'll get into. I'm sure that they're going to want to clean up. Right. That could have made all the difference here. Yeah. But they were certainly, this team is not some huge drop-off from last year. I think they're, yep. they're still a very, very strong team to be to be contended with. Just right off the jump street here, Greg, did UTSA let one slip away? I feel like whoever lost is going to feel like they had yeah, a couple plays so that too. they could have made yep. to, to close the gap there. And, you know, the easiest one to go to is the play late in the third quarter. Yep. UTSA's defense had come up with a couple of three and outs, and then... I think five straight three and outs. Well, because one of those was half. Halftime, so four. Yeah, so yeah. I, I got to go fix that in my story. Still. Yeah. But uh, they, they had a chance to, to, to force a turnover on downs. It was a fourth and one play, and Houston went with the little pitch to the outside. Yeah. And it was snuffed out pretty effectively. But I guess there were 12 men on the field, and I don't know if... It, it wasn't like a situation where somebody was running off. I guess they were just 12 in the formation. Maybe some confusion about whether it was going to be a punt play. You end up with different personal yeah. packages out there or whatever the case is. Yeah, I think that's what that was exactly what happened, but I guess we will have to – I didn't see it. But Houston went on to score on that drive and that they scored drive. on the next two drives yep. to, to take that lead late in regulation. And then, of course, there was the insane comeback from there. But it, the point being that's that – that legal substitution is one that people are going to focus on for sure. And then you can also go to the very last play if you want. It seemed like something was off for UTSA on that yep. two-point conversion attempt in the third overtime. And Frank Harris said he was supposed to send somebody in motion, and he didn't. And yeah. you know, Jeff Trailer took the blame for it because that's what he's always going to do, really regardless of the, the circumstances. And every game they lose, I think that's kind of the, the sort of tone he's going to set with that. So right. it's hard to really say for sure what happened. I mean, you watched the play back, and it looked like the two tight ends kind of moved across the formation, but maybe there was something else that was supposed to happen. Yeah. Frank was under a lot of pressure, and things just didn't look like they operated the way they were supposed to. I, I thought Zakari got held. It certainly wasn't a non-catchable ball situation. We're talking about yeah. the very last play of the yeah. game. Yeah, it was marginal, I thought, because yeah. he – it looked like he almost wasn't trying to get away from the guy. Right. He was just kind of letting the guy face guard him, and then Frank was desperate and just kind of threw the ball up, and Zakari tried to make a play on it, but like, couldn't get around the guy. And So there was some contact there, and I don't know. I wouldn't have been mad if they did call it. I don't know if I'm mad they didn't call it. I think that, that one's a 50-50. What did you think about the play of Houston quarterback Clayton Toon? That was a heck of a performance, right? Yeah, it seemed like one of the focuses for UTSA was trying to figure out what to do with him when he yeah. tried to get out of the pocket and run and create some scramble situations. And he they, just, they just couldn't get him down. I yeah. mean, he, he made something out of nothing a bunch of times. I think on their last – so their last drive to set up the field goal for a 27-24 yeah. lead, I think it was, yeah. with, with less than a minute. They went 10 minutes and 30 seconds. Jeez. They covered like 77 yeah. yards. Yeah. And they converted, I believe it was – five third downs and I think he ran for four of them yeah so it was just like when they needed him to make a play and scramble and get loose they were able to do that because you know it felt like the passing game I, I didn't look at the numbers but it felt like they were they didn't get exploited that way right UTSA was pretty good against the pass and that was back. and even like you know the running backs it felt like didn't yeah. really get going as much yeah. it was just a lot of things too to get the issues it. yeah um, I want to stay right there at the end of the game end of regulation scenario it looks like Houston's gonna drain the clock there one does UTSA need to have timeouts in their pocket in that situation is it fair to ask that question yeah there's got to be a good reason that they burned them I don't remember all of the plays specifically but a lot yeah. of them it feels like there's some kind of mix up or something that's not right. in order before the snap that they feel like they have to get themselves into a better situation yeah so then you do in a game like that want to have them at your disposal when it's coming down to the wire at the same time, if you don't use them to correct whatever issue that you're having, that could yeah. put you in an even worse spot. Yeah. And I think probably when some of those, at least one or two, would, would have been burned, they were probably in a pretty advantageous position and didn't yeah. think they might need them. Bro. Right. 
last minute scoring kind of yeah. situation. But I mean, the way the clock works in college football, that it stops after the first down. I don't think as much as the NFL, you have to work. Not that it doesn't matter, but you don't really. You need can them. work around it yeah. in, a, in an easier way because of that extra time that you get when you. So Houston burns like eleven minutes off the clock. It was ten thirty. Yeah, yeah, on that drive, UTSA ends up coming in with the third down stop to get the field goal, and then I was down on the field, so I couldn't really, you know, absorb what was happening. But Frank drives them right down the field. Oscar yeah, it Cardenas. was like a thirty-five yard pass to. Cephas, and then they found Cardenas, Cardenas down the seam. And I don't know, I, you'd, I'd have to look back again at how Houston was defending it, but you don't always expect them to go down the seam there because you have to be able to get up and spike it. Right. Um, and they did spike that it with two seconds Two left. seconds, so yeah. They had the tiniest of, of margins for error there, but it must have been like this is the play that, that, you know, if they don't want, if a defense doesn't want you to complete a sideline pass, they can take that away. You right. Know, it's not yeah. a big enough area of the field. And so they, they felt like they had to take the chance to, to work it down the middle, and at least that gives you time to, you're just running straight up and getting yeah. set. They right. were, like, right between the hashes, so it was pretty easy. So you go from giving up a two-score fourth-quarter lead to rallying to tie the game, and now we're headed into overtime, and that was kind of crazy itself with the – the two field goals, the two touchdowns, and two point conversions, and then obviously the last stretch there. What was your takeaway on overtime? Is just that they, I mean, kind of crazy. It's just kind of you don't know what's yeah. going to happen there. I don't. I wanted to look back at it. We were just talking about this. The I don't know how uh, Houston ended up with the ball first both times. That would seem to be disadvantageous, and it must have been something with the way they were. Somebody chose to defer what side or of the whatever, field or, or something. Yeah. At first, I thought it might be something like that, like with the student section. There's yeah. been a, there's been a case before where they wanted to be able to play in front of that student section rather than than take their choice there. But that wouldn't have made too much sense from UTSA's perspective because they a got to play in front of the students and also had the advantage of going second both times. Yeah, so that was weird, and I probably shouldn't even brought it up since I have no idea. No, well, but, I would say, but they we got to fi- figure it out. The, the first sequence they went both both. You know, offenses didn't do that much. Yeah, they settled for the field goals, and then it was the uh, the second one uh, where they both got in the end zone and they both converted. And it looked like Houston's conversion w- wasn't going to count, and then it ended up that he dragged the toe. And then UTSA, you know, Frank had. I remember Frank had a pretty easy time on the conversion. I don't even remember what the touchdown play was because yeah. it was just such a sequence of, of, of crazy things happening all over the place. But and then it comes down to those final two point conversions and. You know, Houston ended up getting backed up to the eight, so you think that you're in a pretty advantageous spot there after the false start. But man, he Tune again got loose and flips over a guy and gets head in. first. That was crazy. And then uh, for UTSA, we talked about how that play just kind of didn't seem to work out well on the tune, so that's how you end up on the losing end. But it underscores the point that it was as close as it could have been, and, and these teams were pretty much even. Triple overtime thriller today here in the Alamo Dome. Greg, I want to cycle back, and I want to talk about the play of the offensive line. We saw Venli Tatafu start mm-hmm. at left tackle. Makai Hart start at right tackle. And he went down early in the game, and he did not come back. And, you know, for a unit that was sort of already thin yeah. at left tackle, that Makai Hart injury looms big here. Well, because Demetrius Allen wasn't here. Uh, right. We don't know exactly all the status of that at this point. We'll find out. Potentially we'll find out something Monday. We yeah. didn't have time to get to it in the post game today. And then... So on the right side, then end, it ends up that Makai goes out, and initially Ernesto Almaraz came in. Right. But then next time I looked, it was Frankie Martinez. And he was like, playing significant like he snaps. played the bulk of the yeah. game, I thought. Yeah, in the second half. They could have been rotating because right. there, th- there was a series where Kevin Davis rotated out. There was a right. series where Terrell Haynes rotated out. I feel like Maka played every snap, but yeah. I, I could be wrong. Yeah, I, you know, it's easy to miss one or two. So they, were, they had to kind of mix and match up there a little bit. And, I mean, it was a tough matchup to begin yeah, with, and right? It, it showed. You yeah, know I mean, they couldn't get anything going with the running game. Frank was scrambling at the beginning of the game, and yeah. I mean, they didn't get a lot of yards on their like called run plays. Yeah, a lot of the rushing was from scrambles or, or things that were improvised. And uh, in terms of the pass protection, there were times where it felt like they held up pretty well, yeah. but there were also a lot of times that Frank was under duress, like the last play in particular. Right. Um, and Jeff said they tried to do a lot of different things in terms of bringing some tight ends over to maybe chip some guys or to provide some extra help in the blocking to make it easier on the tackles, and it just wasn't enough to offset how strong Houston is in those areas. Big games from two of the big three wide receivers, Zakari and Joshua Cephas. What was your well, takeaway? Well, no, I mean, JT had the touchdown yeah, as JT, well. JT, yeah, yeah. It might have been Zakari had the quietest day, but I felt like they all three showed up. Yeah. It was, you know, evident that when you have those weapons, it's just hard to cover everybody. And, you know, I think we sort of predicted this, but they did wore all three out there yeah. a bulk of the time. 
which is not surprising when you have those kind of weapons. You want to put them on the field as much as possible and not do as much too tight end stuff because they just couldn't get the run game going. So there's not a lot of sense of going to that sort of a package unless you think that really swings your ability to run the football in your favor. And I, I, I thought that that part of the offense looked pretty good. There were some times that, you know, I don't know that this was one of Frank Harris's better games. Mm-hmm. I don't. He didn't. He made the an outstanding throw mm-hmm. to to JT yeah. in the end zone over there. Yeah. Just dropped it in right over his shoulder. You know, the the long pass to Cephas was a pretty standard slant route that Cephas broke free, and they hit some comebackers and different things, but it didn't feel like. Frank made a whole lot of necessarily wild throws or connected on some of those deep balls that we've seen him have success with in the past. And it's just a, probably more of a mark of a good defense than anything. Yeah. Frank Harris is the last yeah. guy you want to get worried about right. his performance after all he's proven to this point. But I don't think that they got maybe their best game out of him, and that could have cost them a little bit in, in chances where they might have scored if he was playing the best game of his life instead. I want to jump to the defensive side of the ball. It seemed like for three quarters the Roadrunner defense played as good as – anyone could reasonably expect and maybe they played I mean were they dominant at some points they were pretty strong at different points and you know one of the touchdowns Houston scored it was after the interception yeah which was um, a short field right here yeah I think it was largely a product of some of the pressure we talked about because you know Frank's hit on the play and the ball pops pops up up. yeah pretty big return so they have a one play touchdown there and so you know, it wasn't necessarily like they were out on the field crazy long, aside from yeah. that last series. But there were so many timeouts and injury stoppages yeah. and whatnot that yeah. I don't know that it was kind of dragged. Yeah, but it seems like from that perspective, you would be less likely for anybody to get gassed. You have a lot of time to, to yeah. recover it. With it felt like every play there right. was a cramp or something that you yeah. know, that there was some sort of stoppage. So I don't think that they necessarily got worn down. I think Houston's just really good, and you can probably only keep them under wraps for so long your major takeaway here that the Roadrunners are I mean there are no moral victories in sports but I mean they were kind of right there with a well, yeah. pretty good team what I wrote about you know this was the first um, could have been the first win against a top 25 opponent yeah. that they've ever had so they're 0-9 now I believe yeah. and the first five before trailer they were losing by close to an average of they 25 they weren't competitive at all you know and then the B- BYU game was BYU pretty close. BYU game seven points. The Louisiana probably should have won that game. Probably should have won both of those. Maybe games. Louisiana game was yeah. a seven pointer, and then yeah. uh, San Diego State was a fourteen point yeah. loss in the first school bowl. So it, they've come a long way in terms of their ability to be competitive in this game. Obviously, this one being as close as it could possibly be. And so I think that's a promising sign. I think you know, not like we needed any more promising signs of the direction the program's going in, but they. they, they that they feel the way they felt after the game to be that down and dejected and disappointed over something that would have felt like an impossibility not that long ago. Right. It says a lot about where they stand right now and probably what their expectations are still going forward. But it was interesting for Jeff to, to talk about, you know, how do they recover from this? Does this yeah. bring your locker room together? Does it kind of tear you down? Because... You got a lot of new guys in that locker room. And it's a really emotional swing week one of 12 or 13 or 14 in terms of how far you go with your conference championship and a bowl appearance. So can they sort of recover from this and be ready for a really tough game against Army is going to be interesting because I do think something like this will take a lot out of you. Had 37,500 and some change here in the Dome tonight, sixth largest attendance in history. Yeah, it was pretty loud. A lot of uh, buildup about attendance and marketing to this game. As always, yeah. There was a, uh, I mean, this was a fun atmosphere, and it was crazy loud, right? I thought so, yeah. The, the there was one wall. point I, I turned, and you're like, I can't hear you what you're saying. You were not that far away. We're three feet yeah. away from and each I other. I couldn't really make out what you were yeah. At, you know, the lower bowl filled in really nicely, right. and then I, we can't tell how full the section above us was because we don't have a I think I saw some photos that but, there were guys, like, up near the rafters. But, yeah, they did. A really, they must have been a decent amount of walk-up, too, because it didn't feel like, excuse me, it didn't feel like necessarily we were trending that way during yeah, the week, and exactly. then suddenly now you end up in the scenario where it's, it's you know, pretty packed. So Good deal. Ho- hopefully, from their perspective, it'll just continue to grow, obviously. You don't always bring in a team that has at least some. There wasn't like a ton of Houston people. I, I thought think. there'd be a lot more Houston fans, and yeah. they were drowned out by the Roadrunner fans. So you're not going to have, you know, you're going to play some matchups where nobody brings, where they don't bring anybody. Right. But it's not like. Texas Southern in a few It's not weeks. necessarily like Houston chunked up the numbers too much. I think it was right. a lot of UTSA supporters who right. mobilized for this. Can we talk about the banner unveiling? That was why you got to talk about the it's, banner. It was unveiling. it's a it's a good looking banner. One. Okay, you want to be positive. About yes, it. I got to I got to be more positive. That's what I hear. So yeah, it was a good okay. looking banner. It just took a little bit to get it 
Was it upside I think down we almost, or I think we gave up for a while. And then boom, there it was. It was just like, yeah, let's move on to the next thing. And then and here's then, the national anthem. And then it came <laughs> rickety, rickety, wobbly over the top. I still didn't think it was going to make it. And then they had There it, it is, so. yeah. Um, That'll be there forever. And good to be back, Greg. We took a little hiatus in the off season, but... Um, That's what the off season's for, yeah. And yeah. Now here we are. Here we are. So uh, any final takeaways? What We hit on everything today? Yeah, they didn't. We, we, we talked about, I think, most aspects of the team. It was just interesting to see some of the guys from a playing plan perspective who were out there a lot. Yeah. Like we saw Traylon Smith, I thought, got a lot of carries. A lot of carries. Sort of prioritized over Brendan Brady, I think which so. is something yeah. that I think I sort of guessed coming into the yeah. year, but you never really knew how that was going to work out. Uh, I think we saw uh, Nick, Nick Troy Fortune yep. played a lot. West Virginia Probably transfer. more than, more than Dewan Griffin, mm-hmm. who, you know, who was also out there. And they just rotated a lot of guys. I was, I think, a. J- Javon Debon, is that yeah. he was out there quite a bit, and uh, Martavius French we saw was a guy we weren't really sure what his role was necessarily going to be, and yep. they say they're going to play a lot of people out there, and they did it. And yeah. So the defense, you, I think everybody got a chance to shine. We'll get we'll get a count. Up. They said it was going to be over thirty, which is a lot. We'll see if that that was the case. I my biggest thing is what does the offensive line look like after today and the yeah, we got to see how Makai's doing, and then. And then figure out what Demetrius Allen's deal is, and when he comes back into the mix, and then see if that you know if Demetrius Allen is back, does Van Lee have the opportunity to play over on the right? Is that even advantageous? You know, do some of these younger guys start to get in the mix? I know Ben Rios and DeAndre Marshall have no, been yeah, well yeah. reviewed, and I don't yep. think either played today. But I don't think so. Either. You know, it's it's not like first that's a slight on there. Yeah. It's the first game for a freshman offensive lineman against a really really tough opponent. You wouldn't want to throw them out there necessarily, but is that a legitimate option if they need it somewhere down the line? We'll see how bad that situation is. What's your fi- my final question for you here, Greg? What was your takeaway from Jeff? Kind of being a little harsh on himself about you know some of the mistakes. It didn't seem like there were that many critical errors certainly when you go back and watch the film there may be more but yeah um i think that's just kind of what he does kind of falling on the grenade i think i think we haven't been around a lot of losses in this era but i feel like that's kind of the tone the way they said it a lot of the times and how he wants that to fall on him rather than the players and you know with the 12 men on the field thing i buy it and everything else you just never know what it is but you know the argument is that the coaches are supposed to put them in the position to, to do you know so if you want to say that it's on him, then there he can do that. There That's probably how he's always going to do it. Well, that'll wrap it up. UTSA starts the season with a dramatic loss to the Cougars. The Roadrunners are 0-1. Next week, they head to Army to Black Knights to I face the Black correct. Knights. So we'll catch you guys after that game. Appreciate everybody watching. Thanks. Later. Awesome.